and quickly, I'm Al Shreesheim, <coughs> the uh, Director Emeritus of Argonne National Laboratory and the President of the Chicago Council on Science and Technology. Welcome the Chicago Council on Science and Technology. For those of you who um, are not, um, don't know what we're up to, most of you I think do, we are dedicated to raising the awareness of critical issues on science and technology that affect society and having that information disseminated to audience like yourselves, Chicagoland, by people who know something about the subject. Uh, so I, talking about people who know something about the subject, tonight uh, Bob Gallucci, who is the president of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and as a aside, the MacArthur Foundation provided a founding grant to the Chicago Council on Science and Technology. So for that, <laughs> we thank you profusely. I have here Bob's bio. I've seen ever too many introducers go through bios in great detail. I am not going to do that. Uh, sufficient uh, unto itself is that he has been on the national scene, the international scene, involved in all matters nuclear for a long time. And uh, the issue of nuclear proliferation, terrorism, how safe are our nuclear reactors, the Fukushima Daiichi situation, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have Bob here tonight. I guess the most important thing about Bob's bio is that he was born in Brooklyn, went to undergraduate school in New York. I was born in the Bronx, and I went to undergraduate school in New York. So uh, with that introduction, Bob Gallucci, president of the MacArthur Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, I want to thank the Chicago Council on Science and Technology for organizing us this evening and inviting me to be here, and thank you all very much for coming. Um, by way of, uh, of preliminaries, uh, I, there are several people in the audience, because we were talking at the, at the uh, reception a few minutes ago. Uh, who are, have expertise in the field that I'm going to talk about. And so I will, I know this is set up to be a classic lecture in a lecture hall, but I, if we can uh, wrap our minds around the idea that this is more of a conversation, and in the middle of my remarks, or in the first quarter or last quarter, if you just can't stand it, don't wait till the end. Uh, and interrupt. I mean, that's, let's, we could turn this into a dialogue and I'll be very comfortable with that. There's, there's no reason with a group like this to be as overly formal. So uh, let's engage one another uh, sooner rather than later. Second preliminary uh, is that is the word nuclear. Um, I don't pronounce it that way. Uh, I add an extra U. So when I say it, it's nuclear. So if you're thinking of sending me an email afterwards, noting the number of U's in the word, you may, but I just warn you, it'll have no effect. Uh, it, it, I, I blame Dwight Eisenhower and his pronunciation in my formative years. Um, OK, so I have not been working for the United States government for a long time. Uh, it's been it's, it's more than 15 years. So I have been, in the last few years, I've been at the MacArthur Foundation. And I think more now, as I ought to, as a foundation president thinks about what we ought to do at MacArthur. And 
in addition to pursuing the areas of work which are well established and trying to get the most leverage and the biggest impact and the greatest good and the greatest reduction in suffering for humanity that we can, we also should do something, and our other foundations do this as well, which is try to look around the corner, as they say, or down the road, look ahead in some way. And we are trying to do that in some sort of rigorous way at MacArthur. We are, as individuals, always a victim of our experience, and mine has been for good or ill for decades in the general area of national security, international security, and from the perspective of someone who worked for the U.S. government, it's been in political military affairs. And that means, I think, in terms of, in terms of threats and opportunity. And if you went to the National War College tomorrow and looked at the syllabus, you would find a section of the syllabus in the very beginning on threats and opportunities. So that when we at MacArthur think around the corner, think ahead, my encouragement to the experts we have at MacArthur is think in terms of threats and opportunities as well as however else you may think of characterizing or conceptualizing what we might be looking for. So in a world of opportunities, we might be looking at the digital media and learning and what we can extract from the way young people are these days approaching information and what that tells us about how we might teach them in a more effective way or more precisely how they might learn in a more effective way. I would say that's an opportunity to be seized. My mind thinks less in those terms. I think in terms of threats. Particularly, I, do, I think in terms of threats as in events that may occur or circumstances that may emerge as contrasted with existing circumstances. So when I think about threats, I don't, I'm not now thinking that I want to cope with, let's say, K through 12 education in America. Clearly, that area needs work. But that's not a threat. That's an existing circumstance. You could say it presents threats, but it's not an emerging situation. Um, I wouldn't look at violence in Chicago or in America as, it's, as, as an emerging threat. It, it's an existing threat. To me, I, when I look around, I am looking at such things that we're working. Our fiscal future is an emerging threat. Right? If we are not careful, we will not be talking about the debt as a percentage of GDP. We'll be talking about GDP as a percentage of our debt. That's a threat, uh, at least it is to me. Climate change, emerging circumstance. It's not that it's not here now. It's just that looking ahead, that phenomenon appears to present prospects for catastrophic weather, something we can appreciate this season, uh, agricultural shifts, coastline loss, a whole bunch of other things. Natural pathogens. Uh, the classic one, if you're in the pathogen world, uh, is the flu of 1918. Maybe 30 or 50 million people, depending on how one counts, died as a result of this flu in those years. A lot of people with family members have this memory in their head. That's that kind of thing, threat. When I think about traditional threats in the world I came from, we would be talking about the threat from the right now, not Soviet, but Russian nuclear weapons. We always thought of the calculated strike, not any longer. But we still worry about it. If we were in government now, we'd be talking about the threat from an accidental or unauthorized launch. The fact that there are still thousands of nuclear weapons aimed at us presents a threat. China, an emerging threat in, in conventional power terms. Proliferation, Iran, North Korea, leading in either case to follow-on proliferation in the Middle East, a domino effect. In Northeast Asia, a domino effect, threat. Humanitarian interventions, will they become more common so that we'll be, as, as 
a country with unique capability to project force, will we be asked to project force over and over again to prevent genocide or genocide-like activities? We're seeing that more and more. What about conventional terrorism? 9-11 writ over and over again. These are the kinds of things that we might be looking at and asking, can we as a foundation, can we as a country do anything to mitigate these, these threats? Bioterrorism. Instead of the flu of 1918, imagine smallpox engineered to be resistant to vaccine. Or imagine someone overcoming the problem of a virus which has greater lethality than a smallpox virus and still would spread and would not be self-limiting. And I'm thinking here of various hemorrhagic fevers. So there's lots of things to worry about. But I wanted tonight, as an entirely uplifting activity, to focus your minds on the issue that I would put at the top of the list of threats to worry about, of these kind that I'm now talking about. I mean, you may have a great threat. Your kid might, won't get into the college if he or she wants to go to. I understand that. I don't mean that. I mean what kinds of things I'm talking about. And that threat is the threat of nuclear terrorism. As it turns out, when people are running for, to be president of the United States, when they're asked what's the greatest threat to the national security, if you took a look in back, you would find they tend to list nuclear terrorism. It doesn't particularly seem to affect them once they become president, um, but it, it, it's, it sort of seems to be intuitive that they would say that. What I would like to talk to you about is why one would want to focus on this why would one would want to take this seriously as a threat to be dealt with? Okay, if we were to be at the National War College where I spent three years, happily, when the military talk about threat, they very often talk about it as a function of probability and magnitude. Probability of occurrence and the magnitude of the consequence if it occurs. You could say product, but we'll be a little looser because we don't actually know how those two things are related. So we'll just say it's, it's, it's a function of probability and magnitude. So the event we're talking about here, though, to be clear, is a true detonation of a nuclear device with a true nuclear yield that causes significant consequences. That's the phenomenon. We are not, in other words, talking about what in the business is called a radiation dispersal device, or an RDD, uh, which will cause a lot of damage and typically, in the modeling, not very many deaths, at least not from the radiation. It may be from the dispersal explosion, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a true nuclear explosion. So, if we're going to focus on this and take it seriously, we must ask the first question, let's focus on the P in the equation, the probability of its occurrence, and then a little bit about the magnitude, and then finally a little bit about what we might do about it. First, the probability. I think the best way to address that is to say that for this event to occur, some terrorist group is going to have to acquire a nuclear weapon, they're going to have to deliver it to a target, and they're going to have to detonate, detonate it when it gets there. Three steps. Fairly logic. I am talking about terrorists. I am not talking about a nuclear attack on the United States of America by some angry country. The reason I'm not talking about that is because I regard that as a much lower probability event, and, and I do believe that, generally speaking, Deterrence, as we came to know and perhaps not love it, but respect it for all those decades, essentially works. Deterrence works nation against nation. It's very, you can't actually prove that. It's a counterfactual. We, the proposition is that when deterrence works, if I was not deterring 
you from striking me, you would have struck me. Uh, right? I will actually not know when deterrence works. If you come up and strike me, I'm pretty sure deterrence failed. But I can't tell when it works. But we are pretty sure deterrence worked for all those years of the Cold War. A at least it didn't fail. So I think it works. And I think we can deter North Korea with nuclear weapons. We could deter Iran if they acquire nuclear weapons. I think we have deterred uh, the Soviet Union in the past. And if you believe that China thinks these kinds of thoughts, I believe we can deter them. So I am not talking about state on state. I'm talking about a terrorist attack and to bring it home on the United States of America. Okay, how would this happen? How would a terrorist first acquire a nuclear weapon? It seems to me that the first way occurs is that they would steal one. They would up and steal nuclear weapons. Where would they steal it from? Well, they'd have to steal it from somebody that had nuclear weapons, and that presents nine targets to them. The original five nuclear weapon states, the United States, now Russia, Britain, France, and China, and then the countries that acquired nuclear weapons afterwards. And that would be an essential order of acquisition, Israel, India, depending on how you count, Pakistan, and North Korea. If there are other countries out there with nuclear weapons, they have not told me. So I think these are the countries they would have to go to to get their nuclear weapons. So they could try to steal them. I find the likelihood of succeeding at theft to be small. It's also possible that one of these countries would up and transfer the weapon to the terrorist group, sell or just simply transfer. Who would be the candidates for that of the list I gave you? There's only one that leaps out to me, actually two leap out, and that would be Pakistan and North Korea. Um, the others seem unlikely. Um, when I think about this, the, th the theft or the transfer, it doesn't seem to me that it's terribly easy to steal a nuclear weapon. Countries can count their nuclear weapons pretty easily, and they tend to control them pretty well. So I think theft is hard, with one shining e exception, and that would be Pakistan. I'll come back to that. What about transfer? I think transfer is unlikely, but plausible in those two cases, the cases of Pakistan and North Korea. North Korea, I would note uh, to you, had um, was, was sufficiently rude to actually transfer a plutonium production reactor to Syria. Think about that for a moment. A plutonium production reactor. For those of you who are not in the business, a plutonium production reactor is a reactor that is designed not to produce power, but produce plutonium, hence plutonium production reactor. It could be connected to a grid, and you know you could get we get district heating from it, but it's, a, it's not what it's for. It's to produce plutonium for nuclear weapons. And North Korea actually built one for Syria in Syria. That's pretty extraordinary. So if you're thinking, well, wait, no country would actually transfer a nuclear weapon. A nuclear weapon would fit nicely, even the first generation one in here, right? They transferred a whole reactor. So don't dismiss this for those two countries. And Pakistan has its own special circumstances. The special circumstances begin with the fact that the country doesn't have, in a lot of cases, the sophistication to control weapons and material that Russia and the United States have. We put all kinds of bells and whistles on our weapons to decrease the likelihood of unauthorized use. Sometimes they're called in the popular literature PALS, permissive action links, but there's lots of other stuff we do that's not accessible to other countries. So unauthorized use is possible. Extraction of the material is possible. And of course, as you may have noticed, if you've been reading, the, those of a more extreme orientation um, uh, have been probing various official Pakistani sites, 
actual military sites. I say probing because there's a theory that this is an antecedent to trying a nuclear site. This would not be good. The most recent one of these in the last couple of days. So Pakistan is a very special case. And it has, by the way, not as much material as Russia, but it has lots more material and weapons than India. And it has probably already surpassed Israel, certainly surpassed North Korea. So it is headed north of Britain and France. So Pakistan, the sometimes radical, almost always unstable, hardly ever democratic country, is headed to be the fourth largest nuclear weapons state on the planet, with all that implies for not only nuclear weapons, but fissile material, both plutonium and highly enriched uranium, the two materials that can be used to make nuclear weapons. This is not a good picture I'm trying to paint for you right now. And by the way, uh, the, in one of the important points I'm trying to make is the vector isn't good. This is not getting better as time goes on. It's getting worse by all the parameters of evaluation. Transfer is a, it's a possibility and not one we can dismiss. Theft is a possibility and not one we can dismiss for these cases. One would have to consider Russia in this list of countries, not because it would ever transfer purposely, but because it's just so much material. Hundreds to thousands of kilograms, i.e. tons of this material. And one would have to consider Russia a potential source of material. So, it seems to me that there's a very, very low probability of the transfer of an actual nuclear weapon and that this scenario would become realized through the acquisition of an already fabricated nuclear weapon. Logically possible, but not very likely, is how I'd sum it up. But what about the fissile material? What about the other route to acquiring a nuclear weapon? What about the terrorist group that decides they're going to build their own? They're going to get the fissile material because the weapon's too hard, and then they're going to manufacture a nuclear weapon, deliver it to an American city, and detonate it. What about that chain? Well, let's put the acquisition of the fissile material, which I've already started to talk to, aside for a moment, and ask the question, if they had the fissile material, who's the they? Some terrorist group. A, an Al-Qaeda clone of some kind. Would we expect that they could actually fabricate a nuclear weapon that would give them a true nuclear yield? The first thing I'd notice, note to you is that the designs for a nuclear weapon are out there for the first generation, indeed second generation fission device. I don't mean on the internet, but I could mean on the internet. It's a lot on the internet if you peruse it, as I do, for this specifically to see how good they've gotten. But, you know, designs are one thing to do a schematic of a design. I mean, there's, there's a story about the sophomore at Princeton, you know, as a, as a, as a project. You know, his, his science project was to design a simple fission device, and he, he, he designed an implosion system, you know, which the... Department of Energy, which was then called IRDA, I think, when this happened, Energy Research and Development Agency, decided to classify. They said it was a workable design. So a lot of people said, well, if a sophomore at Princeton can design a nuclear weapon, why don't more states have nuclear weapons? Why don't more sophomores have nuclear weapons? Well, the answer was because it was just a schematic. And, and it, it, it was like if you did a, a little picture for your renovating your kitchen and you know you wanted to design build that wouldn't be quite enough <laughs> the architect will give you more I'm talking about a little a lot more actually the, the real specifications the thicknesses the material all that that you'd need what you do to an initiator all the various things okay I want you to know that's out there too not in the same way that it's on the internet but the Pakistanis have put that out there it's it's one could acquire this 
lots of, a number of countries have acquired, which, which you would call actually a working design, a design from which an engineer could build. So that's out there. That's one thing to note. Second, there was a, an interesting experiment, much more interesting than the sophomore at Princeton. In 1964 at Livermore, Lawrence Livermore Labs, they did a little project. Um, it was called the Nth Country Project. It involved, I have read, two uh, recent PhDs who had never seen a nuclear weapon. So they were, they were technically trained, uh, I think, physics and engineering, but I actually don't know this. Recent PhDs, as I said, and, and no nuclear weapons experience. And this was in the 60s, mid-60s, so a, a, a fair amount, 50 years ago. They were given a machine shop, the size of a fairly large garage. They were given conventional explosives, nothing sexy or special. And they were asked to build a workable nuclear weapon, and they had a substitute for the fissile material. They did, were not given fissile material. They decided not to build the simple fission device that we used for the first weapon we dropped in wartime, which was the Hiroshima bomb. They decided not, there are two basic designs for a nuclear weapon. One is called a gun type device, it's sort of a cylinder, and the other is called an implosion system, and that's kind of like a ball. And the cylinder is really simple. You know, it's a, it's got fissile material at two ends, high explosives at one end, you detonate one end, and it, uh, and it sends this piece into that piece. Very simple. And they decided not to do that because it was too simple. The implosion system's harder because it, it involves, a, like I said, a ball. You can think of a soccer ball and the little patterns around the little pentagons as the high explosives. And the whole trick is, can you cause a compression that's spherical to press this fissile material together, causing it to look supercritical and producing a nuclear yield? That's harder to do. I mean, in engineering terms, it's harder to do. Easy to conceptualize. They decided to build a harder one, and they built it. Two guys, garage simple machine shop. Now, depending on the material and the circumstances, they might not have survived that activity, but it can be done. And it could be done 50 years ago. So I am submitting to you with that there is a high probability, not a low probability, a high probability that the design and build portion could be done by a nuclear, by a terrorist group that had technical expertise. They would need expertise. There's a certain type of expertise, materials expertise of various kinds. They would need this, but it is demonstrable that it could be done by a relatively small number of people with not a, no specialized weapons experience. If we're talking about a gun-type device, it becomes a trivial matter in terms of design build. The key, I'm telling you, What's separating us from that event is the fissile material. That's what I'm getting to. That's what this talk is about. Where would they get this material? I've suggested countries. Let me give you orders of magnitude. How much highly enriched uranium is there around in the world? The number, the best number I was able to get before coming here for this talk was 1,600 tons. A ton is 1,000 kilograms. I just said 1,600, 1,000 kilograms of highly enriched uranium. How much enriched uranium would it take to make a nuclear weapon? Well, it depends, of course, which design you use, how good you are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But someplace between 20 kilograms and 60 or 70 kilograms. And I'm talking about not kilograms, but tons. Plutonium, the number I've got, this, by the way, I'm talking not about weapons, but not in the weapons establishments. I'm talking about in the energy and research establishments. Weapons aside, 350 tons of plutonium. And I'm talking separated plutonium, not plutonium contained in spent fuel, but separated plutonium. In other words, usable plutonium. 350 tons. Okay, how much plutonium to make a nuclear weapon? That's going to be an implosion device, and the IAEA uses 8 kilograms. 
eight kilograms would be pretty easy. You could go a lot smaller than that to make that weapon. But even if you used eight kilograms, with eight kilograms with 350 tons, that's 350,000 kilograms, that's a lot of material. Where is this stuff? Well, plutonium is principally in four countries, in Europe, and plus it's in Russia, United States, India, and Japan. Uh, highly in, highly enriched uranium, and in Pakistan. Uh, the highly enriched uranium is in uh, the United States, in Russia, principally, but not only, by any means. Uh, the bulk of this material is at various kinds of energy facilities, whether they're reprocessing plants, fuel fabrication plants, plutonium storage facilities, uh, enrichment plants, research reactors, and in some submarine reactors. So it's in a lot of different places, in a number of countries, and it is secured differently in different places. It could be stolen, or it could be transferred. I go back to the North Korea and Pakistan case. Eventually, perhaps, there'll be an Iranian case. Transfer to me is quite plausible. Again, I say if North Korea would build, would build a Syrian in Syria, plutonium production react, it's not hard to imagine them transferring plutonium. Is there any deterrent to transfer? Well, they could get caught at it, and then bad things might happen, and that would presumably be a deterrent. But then, of course, is there any reason to expect they would get caught at it? What would the material look like if it was being moved. The plutonium I'm talking about would fit in one of your cups here, plastic cup. The highly rich uranium would be bigger. And this is not in weapons, but this is, this is the, the core of the material. So I think the idea that they would necessarily get caught and that would fear of getting caught would deter them is not something to count upon. Well, if they could plausibly get the material, and they certainly could design and build the weapon, could they deliver it? What would the package look like? Now, I said uh, a first-generation nuclear weapon that uh, I think that uh, several people I met in this room could help me build would fit in here nicely. So the question is, if it was in here, and you had this in North Africa, or South Asia, could you figure out a way to get it into the United States of America? I would suggest the answer is yes, with pretty high confidence. Uh, there's a friend, Al Carnesel, who used to say that if you want to get a nuclear weapon into the United States, put it in the middle of a bale of marijuana and bring it across the border. That apparently works all the time. But you, the, we, the two things to observe is that we have a very long, unguarded border with Canada, and then Canada does not control its borders particularly well as because it's just too huge. And we have coastlines. As I have said to any number of other people, well, you know, when you go to the marina, you're going sailing on the coast, you know you're always seeing the Coast Guard cruising up and down and checking the boats, right? I've never seen that, right? So why couldn't a boat just come in and, by the way, I should tell you, Homeland Security is on this one. But they're not on this one. You can't get on this one. What we are is we have created, at, if you go to ports, we have created these arches where if the bad guy is somehow smart enough to build this nuclear weapon, he's not smart enough to figure out not to put it in a container where everybody is looking because the containers go under the arches. So, But if you get a stupid enough guy who can do all that and then puts it in a container that has to go under an arch with a detector, he might get caught. But that's only, of course, if he decides not to shield it. If he does shield it, then he might get caught because of the mass of the shielding. But he ain't going to get caught because they're going to pick up a signature, unless he's magnificently stupid. So I'm not optimistic about detection. So finally, if they can design, they can build, they can deliver, what would stop them from detonating? Well, how about the fear that whatever purpose they had would be undercut by the atrocity of killing hundreds of thousands 
of Americans. Does that ring true to you anymore? Because there was a time, I have books on my shelf that said terrorists exist, and the definition of a terrorist is to produce a particular act for political purpose. It is to terrorize, not to kill. You don't want to alienate. Okay, I would submit to you that was then and this is now. That is no longer true of the terrorist groups. That was not the way Al-Qaeda was thinking on 9-11. And it is not the way Aum Shinriko was thinking in Japan. This is a terrorist group that, <laughs> that tried bioterrorism, tried chemical weapons, it tried to acquire nuclear weapons. It did, in fact, kill a bunch of people um, uh, with a, a subway attack, sarin attack, but it didn't... It, it made 5,000 people sick and a far fewer number of people died. But they, what they were trying for as an apocalyptic event, mass casualties. So what I'm telling you is I would not hold out for the humanity of the terrorist groups these days as to what would save us. What about if I sum all this up and say this does not seem like an unlikely event, and then you say, well, gee, what about in 24? We always catch them. Well, Detection's very hard, as it turns out. For anybody who's familiar with uh, uh, nuclear emergency search teams and how they operate, and you wouldn't be intimately familiar, but you might know generally that we have these people that deploy. You may be not happy to hear that they have deployed um, because of a nuclear threat in the United States more than once. Uh, it's very hard to find that needle in a city of a haystack. Do they have all kinds of, you know, state-of-the-art sensors? Yes, they do. Uh, are they very good? Yes, they are. Do they think, if they have no other information other than there is a weapon somewhere in Chicago and they arrive, that they will find it? Again, if you assume a spectacularly stupid terrorist, yes. But if you don't assume that, the answer is no. If you can tell them what block it's on, much better shot. So we do have detection capabilities, not something to rely upon. Okay, what about the magnitude? Are we talking about something extraordinary here? There was a time when I wouldn't have to even spend any of your time on the magnitude of a nuclear explosion and the implications, but it seems to me that when I'm talking about nuclear terrorism, I should. I already said it is not an RDD. True yield. So two cases. One, the big case. The big case is unlikely to be Hiroshima and Nagasaki with a 12 kiloton or 15 kiloton or 20 kiloton. Kiloton is thousands of tons of TNT equivalent. Big end would be around 10 kilotons. But 10 kilotons, which is a very small nuclear weapon for nuclear weapon magnitudes, would vaporize everything, would vaporize everything within 500 yards. Out to three quarters of a mile, 100% lethality. Everything within a radius of three quarters of a mile. Half the people would die within a mile and a half. It would be ground burst, so not only would you have the initial radiation, but you'd have very significant, significant residual radiation because of ground burst. When we drop our weapons, they were air burst, and the fireball actually didn't touch the ground, therefore a lot less radiation. What about something that would be considered certainly tactical, and in some cases a fizzle, something in the area of a kiloton, a thousand tons of TNT equivalent. Very, very small. Radiation would kill proportionally lots more people with a small nuclear weapon than with a big one, proportional to the other ways by which people die as a result of the effects of a nuclear weapon. Radiation would be much more important. The plume would go about a quarter of a mile wide and about nine miles long. Radiation would be important. Significant deaths would continue for two weeks as a result of radiation. 
if in the first case, a 10 kiloton weapon, we were thinking here of up to the neighborhood of a quarter of a million people promptly killed. A quarter, this is not casualties, these are deaths, a quarter of a million. In this case, you'd be tens of thousands to 100,000, depending on the city and a lot of other circumstances. And think what 9-11 meant to this country when 3,000 people died. So, what's to be done about this? I'm trying to persuade you that this is not, well, it's a low probability event, is not an extraordinarily unlikely event. And I hope you are not like some of my colleagues at Georgetown, who are terrorist experts, who in arguing with me said, but it hasn't happened yet. Yes, that is true. But the circumstances that make, that define the probability of this event are not improving. And that's what I want to close with here. What should we be doing as a policy response to deal with this? One, you know that line when you're in a hole, what should you do? First thing, stop digging. And in this case, that means stop producing more fissile material. It would seem pretty simple. Unfortunately, we're increasingly producing more fissile material. Well, don't we need fissile material? My answer, and some of you I hope will argue with me, is no. Fissile material, we're talking about Fissile being a, not fissionable, but fissile. Fissions with both slow and fast neutrons, weapons, usable materials, plutonium or highly enriched uranium. Neither of these occur in nature. The only place plutonium occurs is in a nuclear reactor where uranium-238 transmutes the plutonium. The only place you get highly enriched uranium is in an enrichment facility where you take natural uranium and you enrich it, increase the proportion of the isotope uranium-235 so you have a higher amount, like 90% uranium-235, instead of 0.7%. So why don't we stop doing that? Do we need that? Well, you don't need plutonium for anything. Could you use plutonium for something other than weapons? Yes, you can run reactors with it. Can we run reactors without it? Yes, my argument. So run it without it, and don't produce any more plutonium. Highly enriched uranium, do you need it? E no. And, well, you need it if you want to have a submarine reactor. No, you don't. Other countries run their submarines and their naval reactors without highly enriched uranium. Our country produces it for that. Apart from that, you don't need it for research reactors, which was the other legitimate use. We've gone around the world reducing the enrichment levels required to run reactors. Why don't we just stop producing highly enriched uranium around the world, stop producing plutonium around the world? At least we would have stopped digging. And then we can go to step two. Control the stuff that we've got better than we have. That seems reasonable to me. The whole program, initially called Nunlugar, later the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, is aimed at doing that, and we've made a lot of progress in a place like Russia. A lot more progress needs to be made. Control the material that exists. And then the third step, stop digging, control what you have, start destroying it. The highly enriched uranium is terrific to destroy because you destroy it by blending it down and then using it in a nuclear reactor to produce electricity to light the lights. Perfect. We've done that in a special program with the Russians. Keep doing it until there's none left. Plutonium, get rid of it. Now, get rid of it. It turns out to be tricky because those who love plutonium in fuel want to burn it in fuel. But if you keep doing that, you keep the plutonium around and you give reason to people who want to produce more of it. So I'm not for doing that. I'm for treating plutonium as radioactive waste certainly has the risks to the environment that other radioactive nuclides have. So treat it that way, treat it as waste, and dispose of it. And dispose of it in some terms, some type of long-term storage. Yes, if it could be absolutely burned and destroyed, I'd be for that, but I want to see the model before I buy it. So the first thing is get rid of the fissile material. The second is deterrence. This is tricky. It's not tricky at the level of telling countries that if you find out that they purposely transferred nuclear weapons or, nu or fissile material to an another country or another terrorist group, we will, and that, that group builds a weapon that causes damage to the United States or its ally, we will treat this country 
as the perpetrator. That seems to me pretty straightforward. Why don't we do that? I'm not sure. Have we done that? Did we, after we found out from the Israelis that North Korea was building a plutonium production reactor in Syria, did we do anything about that? No, actually we didn't. Did Israel do something about that? Yes, they did exactly what they did when they found out that they didn't really like the reactor that the French were building in Iraq in 1981. They bombed it and destroyed it. They did the same thing to the Syrian reactor. They bombed it and destroyed it. Well, what did we tell the North Koreans? Did we tell them that as a result of that, we were going to take out some facility in North Korea? This was in the Bush administration. No, we didn't. Did we tell them that if we ever catch them again, something very, very bad would happen to them? To the best of my knowledge, we didn't. We must be very clear that transfers, if people get caught, will cost them. That seems to me pretty straightforward. The more difficult question is, what do you tell countries who, would, who do not have governments that you would expect to support transfer. Suppose material comes, it's used in a weapon, and it blows up an American city, and 150,000 Americans are promptly killed like that. And the scientists who go to the scene, and we have these people, it's a very complicated thing between the Department of Energy, Homeland Security, the FBI, the CIA, and our laboratories. Go to the scene, collect the material, take it back, do the forensic analysis, and they attribute the material to a facility in Russia. What do you expect your president to do? Bomb Russia? Go to the Russian government and say, Look what you did, and the Russian Putin says, sorry. What, we, what do you as American citizens want the president to do? The president says, ah, the Russians did it. Oh, sorry. Is that all? 150,000 dead Americans? Suppose there are two weapons went off, three weapons went off. Suppose on one day in American history, we lost New York, Washington, and Chicago. We would not be a superpower. We would probably still be a great power, but we would be absolutely devastated. Okay, so that's one, two, three cups of plutonium. All right? It, and it came and we identified the reactor and the reprocessing plant through our forensic analysis, and it was Russian. And we don't have any intelligence that the Russian government was behind it and wanted to do it. They were stunned. They were appalled. But it happened. What do you expect the president to do? Suck it up? Or extract something from the Russians? Suppose it was Pakistan. And a Pakistani government, such as it is, had nothing to do with it. What do you expect the president to do? I, I have an idea. I, would, I have proposed this in writing, published it. And that is that we ought to anticipate this, and we ought to tell these leaders. It would have to be a certain kind of heart-to-heart, -heart, and I'm familiar with how that happens. It's actually got to be head of state to head of state. Uh, and say, if this happens, I will have to take some action, or I will be impeached, and whoever follows me will take action. Unless I can demonstrate that you did everything everything possible to control this material, and it was like, it was as if it came from Pantex, an American facility. We wouldn't bomb Colorado. So it's got to be that kind of thing. And you would use this early on now to push these governments to control their material, anticipating what would happen. I'm telling you, I think you should look ahead at this one. Okay, what else should we do besides think about deterrence, which is what I was just talking about? You ought to enhance your capability, in fact, to do your forensic analysis and attribute the material to some producer of that material so that you can tell the world you can do this in a reasonable amount of time and you will use that attribution and extract a price. That's called deterrence. 
if you can't tell where it came from, you only have a terrorist group, and you know that at least some of these terrorists are quite prepared to die for their cause, very difficult to deter someone who values um, your death more than their life, to put it bluntly. So that's something you can do. Defense, I like defense. Defense is terrific. We should do everything we can at our borders. It will not be enough. If your plan is to catch these guys bringing it into the United States, you don't have a plan. I think you also need to redefine your security policy and the way you think about the Iranian case right now. I mean, right now, the Iranian case is when will Iran get nuclear weapons? That's the question, the policy question. In every paper I look at, it is the wrong question. I don't actually care that I care, but I'm, for purposes of drama, I'll tell you, I don't much care whether Iran gets nuclear weapons. I care whether they get fissile material and whether they transfer the material to some group that would attack us because I don't think Iran can attack us. I think Iran is going to be deterred from attacking virtually anybody because our extended deterrence works. The most that Iran will get out of it is a second thought on our part before we attack them, and that's okay with me. But I think the question has been the wrong question in public policy. It should be, when would Iran get the fissile material they could transfer? The fissile material that North Korea already has and Pakistan already has. So we have to redefine the question, and then you as American citizens, me as American citizen, have to think about part B of point four, and that is, are you prepared to take preemptive action to stop that country from gaining that option? That, to me, is a very hard question, which I would not propose to answer. Finally, and I do mean finally here, I have gone on. Finally, I would think long and hard if I was thinking about nuclear energy before I would embrace a fuel cycle that used separated plutonium. I do not believe there is a technology right now that allows you to extract plutonium from spent fuel in any of the various varieties of these technologies that are out there that is immune from presenting the threat of extracting that plutonium and making weapons. I, I don't know whether you know this or not, but one of those Japanese reactors was fueled with plutonium. It's called a mixed oxide fuel load. It was a relatively small mixed oxide fuel load. Um, it was reactor number three. About 6% of the core of that reactor had mixed oxide fuel. I tried to rough this out. I think there was about four tons of mixed oxide fuel there. 8% of that would be plutonium. So that reactor, I'm estimating, had around 320 kilograms of plutonium enough for at least 40 nuclear weapons at that reactor. And by the way, when it's mixed oxide fuel, it's just, it's just mixed. You don't have to do a lot. It's mixed with uranium oxide. It's a simple chemical process to separate the oxides. It's actually simpler than that, but I can't tell you how much simpler. It's even simpler than that. So I don't favor doing that because we can't control it. For me, the bottom line, the one thing that makes this most dangerous is the fuel cycle choices that we make in this country and that other countries make. And right now, a lot of other countries are contemplating using mixed oxide fuel, which for me would be a game changer and is something to which this issue that I'm talking about tonight, the terrorism issue, is enormously sensitive, I believe, to the fuel cycle choice we make in order to get the energy we need. So I hope you have a great evening tonight. Um, <laughs> I know that I will. Thanks very much. <laughs> Alan, have I talked long enough so there's no time for questions, or should we still? Uh... OK. Yes, sir. Okay, um, I don't know why one would have to choose here. 
I mean, in other words, I think if we were talking about uh, the foundation and we were sitting around thinking whether we wanted to spend time on uh, uh, time and money supporting work on uh, either adaptation or mitigation with respect to climate change, or do we want to spend more money on, say, fuel cycles? I would say both, uh, probably. Um, to me, there's something uh, quintessentially dramatic and awful about the nuclear terrorism thing. It is, I mean, you, you did hear, Alan said, I've spent virtually my whole professional career working on the nuclear weapons issue going back to the 60s. You know, even when I was a graduate student, I was, actually when I was in high school, I was fascinated by on thermonuclear war by Herman Kahn. So I, it's truly a perverse interest on my part. But I, I, I wouldn't want for a moment to downplay the significance of, of, uh, of climate change. But that's, that's a slow motion process. This is not. Um, the fusion, it, um, for a long time, uh, we, in the United States and elsewhere, there were, we were looking for some method of being able to accomplish um, fusion without a thermonuclear weapon detonating. Uh, and because if we could, the idea was there's an awful lot of hydrogen out there, and uh, that's an awful lot of energy, and you could do that without all the nasty stuff that you get when you have a fission reaction of all those nasties that are produced. So the question was, could you produce fusion? And then we had the tokamak, which was the big circular jobby. And we also had, pardon my technical language, and, and we also had the possibility of inertial confinement fusion, uh, the idea that we would focus lasers on a pellet and, and, and uh, produce fusion. Um, and there were competing technologies. I think for the purposes of this talk, the, there are uh, two points to make. One, should we succeed at this and we can move and be able to move from physics to engineering an energy source, source out of this, that would be transformational. I think it's easy to say. Uh, I, as a, someone in the government, worried about <laughs> proliferation. And I, I, when you worry about proliferation in the government, you're not worried about only what, uh, what most people think of, which is getting a fission weapon. But we were very worried about getting thermonuclear weapons because if you think in terms of orders of magnitude, if you think about a fission weapon being a couple of orders of magnitude greater in destructive capacity than a small one, than the largest conventional weapons, then think about what thermonuclear weapons mean, another couple of orders of magnitude in terms of yield. So we were very concerned about uh, the design of the pellet. <laughs> the design of the pellet was a little too, if you knew a lot about it, revealing about the physics of a thermonuclear weapon. And there was, and still is to some degree, a true secret. Subsequent to Howard Merlin, it's less of a true secret, but there, used, there was a true secret in terms of physics terms to how you design a thermonuclear weapon. And it'd be nice to keep that secret. I mean, it's better if India and Pakistan if they are going to have a nuclear war, have it with fission weapons than thermonuclear weapons. This is, we're talking the degrees of megadeths here, but still uh, something to care about. Yes, sir? How would you determine which plant that it came from to determine that that's where that? OK. We're talking about attribution, right? Yes. OK. Yeah, that's called spoofing. Okay, so let's take the, a simple case uh, that uh, in this backpack is a uh, nuclear weapon, and uh, we get it before it's detonated or pre-det. Right? You ask the question: If we give it to the scientist and they're able to get that weapon pre-det, what would they do to try to figure out where it came from? Well, they'd use all the normal intelligence methods of Right? But technically, what would they do with that weapon? Well, at first, they'd look at the design and try to, what do they know about the designs of different people's nuclear weapons as well as improvised nuclear devices? What do they expect that design to look like? So to try to look at the design to begin with. Then it would be the material. Is it plutonium? Is it highly uranium? Unlikely to a composite, more likely one or the other. So you'd, you'd say, okay, that's, that's, that's good to know. So if we're looking for plutonium, where might it come from? And then, uh, as it turns out, there are certain signatures that both plutonium and highly enriched uranium would have. Plutonium would have the signature of the reactor it was produced in. 
And if there was a lot of even isotopes, it was in a high burn-up, a lot of that stuff was there. So maybe it was a power reactor. It came from a power reactor. It was reprocessed in a, in a facility. If it, if it was, um, uh, the signature was different, they might be able to determine that it came from a heavy water moderator reactor rather than a light water moderator reactor. And that would also point them in one direction or another. If it was highly enriched uranium, uh, they would first uh, be looking at uh, ratios of isotope to see what was the technology. Was it gas centrifuge or was it diffusion? Uh, that would help them a little. Unfortunately, the, uh, <laughs> the centrifuge technology has diffused thanks to uh, Johnny Appleseed, also known as A.Q. Khan, who spread this technology around the world. But you'd be doing that kind of thing. Um, it gets much more technical if you start doing the analysis. And by the way, if that we get, if there's a detonation and they're collecting soil samples, they're doing essentially the same thing, but they'd rather do that than soil samples. Um, and, and you're working backwards because of what happens in a nuclear reaction in, the, in, the, in a, a nuclear weapon. But you're essentially trying to eliminate more than designate um, who might have produced the material. Very hard to go much beyond what I just said without getting into classified areas. You should know that there are very good people at the laboratories working on the very difficult problem of forensics and attribution. Uh, there's uh, good reason uh, to hope that we'll get better at it. And we also want to get better at it in terms of time. If you can imagine yourself one of these poor scientists after one of these events going to the president and the president saying, so when are you going to have my answer? And if he says, ah, three to six months probably, Mr. President, that's, you know, politically that's not going to work real well. So, uh, and then what kind of confidence if you come in and say, we're pretty sure it came from Pakistan. I mean, so there's uh, the character of the proposition as, as well as the time frame in which you can deliver it. And then there's the question of really the hard science of how much confidence you have. Suffice it to say that there are some cases that'll be very easy and some cases that'll be very hard. Back there. Um, nuclear disarmament bears upon this, in, in my view, in terms of the sort of in, a, in an ethereal, atmospheric way. Those four guys, um, all of them unlikely, Schultz, um, Bill Perry, um, Sam Nunn, and Henry Kissinger, of all people, who have come out for true disarmament. I noticed you didn't say arms control, you said disarmament. If there was malice of forethought in your question, I, that's what we're really talking about. These guys are saying, doing away with nuclear weapons. What they're essentially saying, when you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, they don't really think it's going to happen next week or any time in their lifetime. These, none of these guys are young. But if we don't say that that's the direction we're going, we're going in a direction in which we are not going to depend upon nuclear weapons for our security. Therefore, we don't want you to depend on nuclear weapons for your security and say that to everybody. That's a stronger infinitely stronger position than saying, I don't want you to depend on nuclear weapons. I want you to depend on me and my nuclear weapons to defend you. It's a much harder proposition than the one we now use. So disarmament, I think, over the long term is the way to go. If, though, I mean, what I'm concerned about is whatever the probability is that we will get through this year without a nuclear detonation in an American city, whatever the probability is, is a greater probability that over the next 20 years there'll be a detonation in an American city. What I'm trying to tell you is this thing doesn't end at the end of this year or the end of the next year. Our vulnerability to this threat continues, and I'm suggesting to you, depending on fuel cycle choices, may dramatically increase, whatever you think the probability is now. So if you're worried about this, there are, as I said, there's a list of things I laid out a few minutes ago, we, we should be thinking about doing. I think the disarmament thing is a good track to be on. Right now, that is most important um, in the terms in which those four meant it for the United States and Russia to get our strategic systems down in a good and stable and safe way. But that also means eventually dealing with the others. If you don't deal with Pakistan, you don't deal with North Korea, you don't deal 
with these countries, then I, you know it's, it's a it's not clear to me you're having a huge impact on the terrorism problem that I described. Yes. Okay, so um, um, up until the, the, the earthquake and tsunami in, in Japan recently, I was pretty unambiguous about saying that nobody could be serious about climate change and not embrace nuclear energy as part of the energy mix. And I felt that way, not because I thought that there were going to be um, enormous numbers of nuclear starts so that the percentage of electrical generating capacity that came from nuclear energy was going to go up dramatically. Now, it's, we're not all going to become France, where in terms of electrical generating capacity, it's enormous, 80-some percent of their electrical generating. It's not, doesn't cover transport, but covers this. So, but 20, 30, 40 percent is big electrical generating capacity. And this is an energy source that does not have the greenhouse gas problem. So I, it seemed to me that this should be part of the energy mix and that this was a, and here comes the really great part, a safe, relatively safe, nothing's completely safe, energy source. Radioactive waste has always been, to me, an enormous political problem, but not a truly technical problem. What, so at some point, and I don't actually know where and when this happened, some intervener told some judge that a particular radionuclide had a half-life of 20,000 years. And we have, since that time, had a standard for isolating this material from the biosphere that is pretty extraordinary. It's very hard to promise what's going to happen 20,000 years from now. If you said, look, I want to treat this waste in a way that I don't have to worry about it for any reason for the next 200 years, and then we'll see whether we got a smarter idea, my answer is we got that. I got it now. When I went to see two very smart and nice gentlemen who were picked by President Obama to run the Blue Ribbon Commission on the back end of the fuel cycle, radioactive waste management, um, both uh, Scowcroft uh, and uh, Quick uh, Hamilton said that they were, their guidance was, please do not discover Yucca Mountain. So they didn't discover Yucca Mountain. I begged them, and I appeared before them. It's not testimony, but I, I gave a statement to the commission saying, you've got the answer. It's spent fuel storage in cement containers. It's there. You cool it in the pond, and you put it there, and it's above ground passive on site. Well, you know, I don't, on site to start with, if you want to have a place, you know, in Minnesota or someplace where you move it to there, that's okay with me. You don't, you don't need a geologically safe place in, in that sense. You, it'd be nice if it wasn't exactly on a fault, but you know, you, you don't, this is not a very demanding siting except for the backyard issue. So radioactive waste to me, isolating it from the biosphere, something I'm pretty, confident of, as confident of I am as most other things we could do for a couple of hundred years. Right? With existing technology, it's called cement. So I'm not fussed about that. And, and given what I, I, my concern about climate change, this is a good idea, you know, nuclear energy, right? What I didn't want them to discover in the Blue Ribbon Commission was that a really neat thing to do was to use one of these new technologies 
to extract plutonium right, so that we could save uranium, save SWOOs or separative work or enrichment, or decrease the volume of a certain character of waste. Right? And then they were, oh, we'll partition the waste, and they have all kinds of, nuclear engineers are wonderful people. Um, and I know they're in this audience, and I, I, I have unending uh, admiration for you. But um, it, it's, there's too much of a puzzle character to this. Puzzles that, in my view, don't need to be solved. Don't do that. Don't separate the plutonium. That's kind of my, my thing. Treat it as, treat the spent fuel as waste. And I am not arguing for non-retrievable disposal, as some of my colleagues might. Because someday, who knows? I mean, there's an old joke, punchline is, or the horse may talk. Well, or you may find a use for this stuff that's safe. I don't know, but I, so I, but I know the correct, so far as best I can tell from what I've read the commission is saying, is that they have discovered cement and that they are, are gonna advocate this for the United States. This is very important. It doesn't mean the Chinese will do the same or the South Koreans or the Japanese or others, but it's good. Now the one little asterisk on all this is, as you know, I was, um, I was moved by the events um, in, uh, I don't mean that as a pun, in, uh, in, in, uh, Japan, um, and the safety of uh, the reactors troubles me, given what happened, um, in an analytical sense, less than in a uh, particular design sense, because I'm, I know a little bit about reactor safety issues and the, and the design of the reactors, and this was not our best foot forward in terms of safety, but still, uh, analytically, if you think about the way we calculate the safety of various systems and designs, this was very troubling. Uh, and I recognize our regulatory system is different than the Japanese, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I no longer am as sanguine as I once was about reactor safety. Yes? Well, we shouldn't separate any more plutonium. You can't run a reactor without making it. I, I was getting to that. Oh, and okay. Your characterization of separating plutonium is using the technology that is used globally. Everybody uses Purex, and Purex separates yeah. entirely the plutonium from the uranium with a complex, difficult chemical process, but that's the purpose. It originated for producing weapons. There are other I'm going to answer you, but let me just ask, do you have a favorite of these? Of the, of the leading five technologies, do you have a favorite? Just out of curiosity. Okay, good. All right. When this is over, uh, just take two minutes with me. I don't want to subject these people to pyroprocessing right now. But l let me suffice it to say the character of the discussion we will have is I will say that if you're actually going to use this material in a reactor, you are going to have material that can too easily be manipulated at the fuel fabrication point to make a nuclear weapon. He will correctly state that the material that, that's yield that comes from pyroprocessing is not as weapons usable as the material that comes from a process that was designed to produce material for nuclear weapons, the Purex process. He's absolutely correct. So we will disagree on, on, in that narrow band. I'll be right and you'll be wrong. So, but, but that's just a, <laughs> just a, and I say that completely objectively. I hope you have a hook here at some point and just whatever. Okay, one more. Yes, sir. That's another talk, um, uh, and that is really about terrorism and uh, how you should conceptualize terrorism these days. I, I got on the edge of that when I, I told you that 
I, in my view, that the character of the terrorists and the calculation is fundamentally different than the terrorists we knew back 40 or 50 years ago. That the, there are varieties now, whether they are apocalyptic, as in the uh, Om Shinriko case, and that's not the only case, but it's the best known, or they are of the Al-Qaeda case, where they have calculated, it's quite chilling, the number of innocents it would be appropriate to kill based upon the number of innocents in their world, the Arab world, who have died as a result of direct or indirect American intervention or support for activities in the Middle East. They have calculations, and the number goes to about a million point three, and they're okay with God, up, you know, at least up to that level. This is a different kind of terrorism. Now, you ask the question, what do we do about terrorism? You really want to ask, and there's quite a debate in the, in the counterterrorism world, about how much of a counterterrorism strategy involves the kind of thing where you think about special operations forces and what just happened with Bin Laden, how much of it goes after education and, and that concept, how much of it is over a fundamental political unhappiness that is, unhappiness is not the words in quotes, um, over the Palestinian-Israeli situation. And one question to ask is, imagine that was resolved to everybody's satisfaction what would be different in the Middle East? And some people say absolutely nothing of importance, and other people say everything. I think the terrorism discussion would have to take account of all that. It's not an easy discussion. Thank you all very much.